In the very beginning, right here in Genesis 1, verse 28, we're told, God blessed them and said to them, that's to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then skipping down to verse 31, it says, God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. Now skipping forward into chapter 2, it says, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. This word for living being is the Hebrew word nefesh, which means soul. So man is body and spirit combined together to make soul. We're made from the earth. We're made for the earth. God designed the earth for us to live on and actually to rule over. And then it says in the middle of the garden that God created that was pleasing to him, we're told, was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. So God from the very beginning had a specific design for man and woman to live on the earth, to rule the earth together in their physical bodies to the glory of God. In Job 19, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. So he knows he has a Redeemer. He knows that Redeemer is going to stand upon the earth. And then he says, And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. Now that's an amazing statement. After his skin has been destroyed... So his body has died, yet in his flesh, back in his body again, he will see God. Some people say the resurrection is not in the Old Testament. Well, this is the earliest written book of the Old Testament, very possibly, and yet we're told clearly about the resurrection. In my flesh, he says, I will see God. And then he says, I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. So Job in his suffering was being encouraged by the anticipation of resurrection, not just that humanity as a whole would be raised, but that he as an individual would be raised. I myself will see him, my Redeemer, on the earth with my own eyes. I am not another. And it's like the words of, of Jesus in Luke where he says, I am not a ghost. It is I myself. Touch me. Handle me. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as I have. This is the hope of God's people from ages past that we would be resurrected beings living with our resurrected Redeemer on a resurrected earth. Then in Psalm 8, David says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. So the entire earth has been placed under our feet for our rule. That's God's plan for the beginning. It was his plan in Genesis. It's still his plan in the Psalms. All flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Not just in heaven, but in all the earth. God still has a plan for earth. He's not given up on that plan and he's not given up on his plan for man and woman to rule the earth together. Isaiah 60 through 66 talks a great deal about the new heavens and the new earth and what life will be like there. It says, Nations will come to your light, speaking of Jerusalem, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. It says of Jerusalem, You will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth and the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah. And all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. It says, Your gates will always stand open, and they will never be shut day or night. Now, that exact verse is quoted in Revelation 21 and 22 as a reference to the new heavens and the new earth. It says, So that men may bring you the wealth of the nations, also spoken of in Revelation. Then he says in verse 15 of Isaiah 61, 
I will make you the everlasting pride and the joy of all generations. You will drink the milk of the nations and be nursed at royal breasts. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am your Savior, your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Skipping ahead to verse 17. I will make peace your governor and righteousness your ruler. So he's talking about this great city of Jerusalem. There's going to be a new Jerusalem. He's going to experience something that's never experienced in human history under the curse. He says, No longer will violence be heard in your land or ruins of destruction within your borders, but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine upon you, for the Lord God will be your everlasting light. Once again, quoted specifically in Revelation 21 and 22, referring to the new earth. And your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again. Your moon will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. And then will all your people be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. There's a number of promises like that throughout Scripture, and that Hebrew word translated land is the word eretz, which is the word for earth. And so when he says you will possess the land forever, it could just as easily be translated, they will possess the earth forever. Remember Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth. We will rule with Christ over the new earth. That's our destiny as God planned from the beginning. 